From the Woodshed, a casual conversation with Chase Morrill and Ryan Eldridge from Kennebec Cabin Company, the team that inspired the hit show Main Cabin Masters. From the Woodshed is brought to you by Nelma. See the stamp, trust the quality. By Hero Media Arts, connecting small business with new customers. And by Hammond Lumber, your building project partner. Now, from the Woodshed Studios at KCC headquarters in Manchester, Maine, it's Chase and Ryan. From the Woodshed, I'm Chase Morrill. With me, as always, is Ryan Eldridge and hey guys. Maggie Morrill. Hi. We're here to talk about all things Maine, all things cabin, all things Maine cabin related. And a little UMO in there today. And a little UMO. Nothing gets more Maine than UMO. No, University of Maine or no. Yeah. Our guest today is Russell Edgar. He's the Senior Lab Operations and Wood Composites Manager. At UMO. We'll find out <laughs> what exactly that really means when he joins us. But you can find us at KennebecCabinCompany.com, MainCabinMasters.com, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Check out our online store at shop, KennebecCabinCompany.com. Keep the questions coming. Thanks for tuning in. And comments, questions, we love them. So keep them coming. And we want to thank our sponsors. As always, Nelma. You can find out more about Nelma at Nelma.org, EasternWhitePine.org, SprucePineFur.org, HeroMediaArts.com, and Hammond Lumber Company. Hammond Lumber is the official building material supplier of Kennebec Cabin Company. And we're definitely going to find out more about Nelma and UMO because... They're tie- hand in hand, right? Absolutely. I think they do all the testing. But I want to ask Maggie a question. What do you think the Wood Composites Manager and Senior Lab Operations gentleman does? Um, wood stuff. <laughs> Great Fantastic. Answer. I'm excited to talk to him about... UMaine is known for their composites and like their forestry program and engineering and yeah, absolutely engineering. My grandmother was the first. Do you know this? This would be a good trivia this question. A for huge Maggie. moral trivia question. Why am I getting asked so many questions today? You're on the hot seat. Yeah, you've been on vacation for a couple. Your months. namesake, Margaret Morrill, was the first woman. What? You know this in Maine. <laughs> Has nothing to do with dancing. She Cello was- player. No, she was a cello for the Augusta Orchestra, Symphony she, Orchestra, though. Oh, she used to drive around with a cello, right, in the car with all you guys? Yep. Um, a tiny little Toyota Tercel. She would no, have the cello that. in the front seat and cram <laughs> six kids Maggie. in the back. What 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 was her what? degree? I, what? Don't, I, I was not. I what's never or, even met the lady. What's, what's you main or not? <laughs> She's kid. What's you main or not known for? Not a clue. She was the first, hockey. first female engineering graduate from the University of Maine or not. Would never... Ever have gotten that? Even I knew that. But you've got big shoes to fill now. Not, no, I don't. <laughs> you close the gap. That's a quite. That's quite an accolade, though. The first female engineer. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll give you guys a little Ryan trivia. Well, you guys probably know, but the the few world out there doesn't know. I actually went to uh, UMaine Orno my first year for civil engineering. I would not have been able to tell you that. I'll and be that, honest. Oh, this is the kicker. To get in the program, because well, you know when you're young, you think you want to do what your parents do or what you know. So I thought I wanted to be a civil engineer. Nope. Because my dad worked on bridges. I go to these construction sites. And I was like, oh, I want to work on bridges and do construction. Well, it takes a lot of math. And I had to take five years of math in high school to get into the program. Ugh. And I, after one year, I was like, I don't even like math. What the hell am I doing? I'm out of here. <laughs> Off to UMF to be a beaver. So yeah, I spent a year at r trying to be an engineer. And ended up being an English teacher. Well, Ended up with an English degree. That's right. That's right. That's ended up where you are today because of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it'll be great talking with him. We do have some new stuff going on around the woodshed, around headquarters. Um, it's a lot going on. There's so much going on. We started filming again, so yep, it's a new year. We're all refreshed. Yep, we've got a few projects get us through the winter. Snow's coming slowly. We're still filming. I think that's a big thing. There's a lot of confusion on what's going on in the cabin master world. We're here. We're building camps, doing the podcast. Yep. And the actual woodshed bar is getting a facelift. Yeah. So it'll be open and inside safe, COVID safe seating. Got a new menu coming out. This yeah, is, it looks this good. This is exciting. Yeah, it looks good. I got one more question for Maggie. <laughs> Why? What season are we on in cabin master world? Six. Oh, she's killing it. Dang. <laughs> And yeah, we are continue on season six. We are now on Discovery Streaming. I saw that's exciting. I guess I don't know much about Discovery it, Plus. Discovery Plus, which is a streaming, streaming service. service. Maggie knows what's going Putting on. Putting me in the hot seat. Okay, so it will still be playing on the DIY network. Like, so if you have that on your TV, 
you can still watch it. It'll be like reruns or whatever. But then if you don't have it on your like cable package and you would like to watch D- the DIY network and all of the other Discovery network channels, you can get Discovery Plus and you can watch seasons one through five of Main Cabin Masters. Okay, that's an extra service, I believe, right? But if you yes. want to watch it like you normally do, just watch us on DIY. Yes. And once we know, anytime we know more, we'll definitely let you know. As soon as we know more. As soon as we know anything, we let you know. So keep tuning in to find out all the details. And, and we don't know much half the time anyway. <laughs> so that's why we got Maggie here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Maggie. Awesome. Sure. Thanks. All right. Well, we will be right back with our guest, Russell Edgar. When I start a sculpture, there's some idea in my head. I can force that idea and nothing but that idea on the stone. But that's not my style so much. It's more of a conversation where I'm learning what the character of this art piece is as the art piece is developing and evolving. Letting your mind roam happily through possibilities. It's the most important part. Your imagination is the strongest tool in the artist's toolbox. I could belabor it and do every feather and every talon, or can work with your imagination. I'm fortunate in doing sculpture and that it lets me be outdoors and physically active. Those are two joys right there. But then there's another joy, which is the coming together of many things. When it's finished, it's like, oh, look at that. Nice to meet you. You can always go back in and change something, but that doesn't happen that often, I find. If you feel confident in the craftsmanship, then you have more confidence in this creature. And you can say, oh, there you are, faults included. The real work of an artist is taking courage. If you don't dare to do something, you cut yourself short. We are back with our guest, Russell Edgar. Russell, how are you? How's it going, Russell? Great. How are you guys? Very good, very good. Not bad. So first question we have new guests is, Water, coffee, or beer? We do it virtually. Uh, definitely beer. <laughs> well, well, one of us will have some Allagash for you and uh, soda water or whatnot. But, um, yeah, we always have a beer when we're talking to our guests usually. We've done coffee and water a couple times, but yeah, we'll, mostly we'll, beer. We'll send you a, a chip for free beer at the woodshed, so whenever you can, come on down once we're open back up. <laughs> yeah, we have a new tasting room on our property down Thank back, you. so... You have to come I'll be down. there in 20 minutes. Oh, perfect. Yeah. All right. So you work at UMaine and Advanced Composite Center. Let's let's start right. Let's jump right in. Start with that. What? Yeah. What do you do there? And what is it? And what the heck is a composite center? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know what composite is in our world, but yeah. Yeah. So, OK. Russell Edgar. I am the wood composites manager here at the University of Maine's Advanced Structures and Composite Center. That's a mouthful. We used to be known as the Advanced Engineered Wood Composite Center. That's how we started about 20 years ago. Um, And uh, so the focus uh, at that time and continues to be with my job is to uh, do research and development that helps Maine's forest products economy. That's what it Mm -hmm. comes down to. And in our particular case, we look at taking Maine's wood resource and adding value to it and allowing us to compete with other regions. Um, so we don't grow trees as fast as they do down south. Um, we don't grow trees as tall as they do in the Pacific Northwest. Our species only uh, aren't always the straightest or the strongest or the stiffest or what have you. But when you add um, our 
brain power and our engineering power to our forest resource, um, we can make products that can compete with anywhere in the world. So that's our mission really is to support Maine's forest products economy and its businesses and also educate its future workforce, right? We are a university. Yeah. So we've got about 200 students that work here um, as well. And um, some of them work on our team, which focuses on all things wood. Um, and they get real world training with real world companies. And um, many of them go out and work for uh, forest products companies here in the state. Interesting. Yeah. You know, one th I think the one thing I remember about your program, I mean, it's national program, really well known as the Norway Spruce. Like you guys did some work with that. And, um, you know, the other thing I hear about the programs up there is the 3D printer up there. But that's, is that the engineering department or is that with you guys? No, that's a, the, the world's largest 3D printer is about 50 feet yep. um, that way, um, inside of this building. And um, so the Norway Spruce one, I can start with that. That is work that we do in collaboration with Nelma. So you guys yep. are familiar with Nelma and I know you work with them often. We are, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> And good old Jeff Easterling and um, yeah. his team. So uh, we work with them closely as well, and we support all of their efforts. Um, in, in terms of Norway Spruce, the work that we did, they, um, back in 2016, decided to uh, in, uh, go through the testing that's required to add Norway Spruce to the spruce pine fir south lumber category. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't need to go into details about it, but there used to be nine species in that lumber category and we added a 10th, which was Norway spruce. And that had an immediate impact on uh, lumber mills in the Northeast because there's a lot of Norway spruce out there. And all of a sudden, once it was approved for use and you could stamp Nelma number two or what have yeah. you on, on that uh, lumber, um, those mills could now start harvesting those trees um, and and sawing them into lumber, whereas before, technically, they couldn't. And they'd have to drive beyond those Norway spruce stands to go find other species of um, red spruce or white spruce and or a out a little bit further. A lot of those Norway spruce groves were planted, were, was it government, pro is that correct, that sometimes the government, you know, paid to have reforestation done with the Norway spruce? That's right. So back in the 1930s, actually, um, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the yeah. CCC, um, was putting people back to work after the Depression or during the Depression. And one of the major efforts was to reforest um, uh, many farmland, things, forests that had been cut down, turned into farmlands. They wanted to reforest them. So they planted a ton of Norway spruce, and it turns out that um, New York State is dirty with it. It's everywhere, um, but there's actually quite a bit in Maine as well, um, and Vermont and New Hampshire and, um, and throughout the Northeast. So we have a good amount of it, and you see them out there. You probably don't notice it, but when you drive down the interstate, down Route 95, um, in the median often, you'll see gigantic, beautiful specimen Norway spruce trees. And you can tell because the branches actually go upward at the end. So you see these nice trees with these upward bending branches. And they're spectacular when they're allowed to grow out in the open. And here on the campus of the University of Maine, we got a ton of them all over the place. And nobody knows they're little old Norway spruce trees. <laughs> but, uh, but like you said, um, Chase, the, those trees that were planted by the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 30s, what was that? That was uh, 90 years ago. 90, I'm going to do some math real yeah. quick. 90 years ago. Well, if those trees don't get harvested um, soon, right, they're going to die and, and go to waste. So why not turn them into some useful forest products like lumber, for example? And actually, a lot of those trees are 90-year-old spruce tree. They're beautiful, big trees that yield some really nice lumber. Now, why did they pick Norway spruce? Was it because of the cycle, the timeline? and? It adapted to Maine's climate. It was a lot like Norway's. Yeah. So um, the history of it, um, it, there was some initial work done by Harvard University back in the late 19th century. And they did find um, that those trees that were imported from Scandinavia actually did really well in our soil and our climate. Um, relatively flat, fast growing. And, and so they started planting more of them. And at the time they felt that it would be a, a really adaptable species for our climate and our region. So there was a lot of it planted. There was also a lot of red pine planted. Yes. 
you can tell these, you can drive by them. I've got some near my house right here in Orono. You can drive by on these side roads and you see them, they're all growing in rows, yeah. right? Like corn. And if you see that and the trees are big enough, they're probably either red pine or Norway spruce that were planted a long time ago. And then a, it, a, there's a story about the Rockefeller Christmas tree in a Norway spruce. Yeah. Um, I don't know too, too much about that other than you might have heard about that tree in the news, right? Every year, New York City yep. puts a beautiful uh, spruce tree. And this year, <laughs> they called it the Charlie Brown, and which is unusual because usually they go out into the woods and often it's in <laughs> upstate New York and they find the most spectacular Majestic. Norway spruce tree. <laughs> You know, this is for New York City. They're not going to plant a Charlie Brown tree, but um, and Boston that. does the same thing, and so um, they they do that every year. And actually, uh, there's an article online that I was looking at earlier today where um, Habitat for Humanity for years has been taking that tree after the Christmas season in Rockefeller Center and um, cutting it down and cutting it into lumber and using it in homes. Um, oh, that's awesome! Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah. This one came with an owl too, I believe. Yeah, no, this year's tree was That's right. bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I totally missed this. Oh, yeah. It was, it was not a oh, beautiful no. looking tree. So, get, getting that to be the 10th species was quite a process, right? Do you do this rigorous test you guys do? Can you explain some of the, the tests you guys do? It's strength and tensile and stuff <laughs> yeah. like that, huh? Yeah, you know enough to be dangerous. Over there. <laughs> That's what he always. Oh, yeah, just enough. <laughs> Yeah, we actually did over 1,100 tests, 1,100 different pieces of lumber. So what happened was um, Nelma went out and sampled lumber from, um, I believe there were seven different regions. There were four different regions in New York because there were so many of them, Maine, Vermont, um, and Wisconsin. And so there were two by fours, uh, two by sixes, and two by eights, and they were all sent here. And we tested them in bending and in tension. Mm -hmm. And from those tests, you derive all of the design values. So stiffness and strength and tension capacity and compression and all these things that engineers need to know to uh, build buildings. So we did all that testing here. And um, sure enough, when you group it together with all those other nine species, there's a procedure that you grow through and you either pass or you fail and um, it passed. So it had the values that were similar to the other species in the grouping. So it was found to be similar to red spruce and mm -hmm. to white spruce and to balsam fir and the other species that grow in our region. And actually of those 10 species in that grouping, seven of them grow in our region. Oh, wow. Three of them are from the Pacific Northwest. So, um, so it's a good thing for, for our region and our lumber mills, and it gives another use for Norway spruce trees that might otherwise either die out in the forest, or maybe they were used for making paper, but now it's got a higher value um, purpose. Well, Very interesting stuff. It, it is, absolutely. Now is that, that, that was the first tree that had been tested in quite a long, you know, adding the 10th tree species to that. It was the first one in a while. Are there any new more trees coming into fruition or anything possible like candidates that. yeah right <laughs> something we should be investing in what, now what, what's the dating world look like in, <laughs> in possible trees out there anyways <laughs> it's a good question uh you wonder how many other candidates are out there i mean to be a, a merchantable um, commercial species right it's got to meet certain criteria there, there has to be enough of it out there to make it worthwhile it's got to grow straight it's got to have certain stiffness and strength properties it can't be uh, balsa wood or, or, or it can't be something small and scraggly that's never going to grow into a tree that's worth cutting into lumber um, so I can't think of any right now that would be in our region probably next candidates um, but you never know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, the other thing is um, the Wood Composite Center, again, we historically didn't focus as much on lumber, but more on wood composite. So if you have smaller scraggly trees or ones that aren't quite as stiff and strong like aspen or popple, right, that's a good example. For years and decades, that was considered a weed, a weed yeah. species, and it didn't have any particularly good use. 
And then they realized that when they started making oriented strand board, it's the best species possible to make OSB out of. It just turns out for a lot of technical reasons I won't go into that it's perfect for making, a, for if you're gonna squish it under high heat <laughs> and pressure, it ends up being fantastic. Um, so then no longer was it a weed species, right? And so the question is, are there other species out there um, that 10 years from now might actually, might, today might not have much value, but 10 years from now, maybe there will be. And Eastern hemlock is a good example, right? It's all over the place yeah. in the wood grain. But, um, and I don't know if you guys use it much in your projects. Because of the um, climate right now, they're sawing it up a lot more and we're getting it as, you know, two by fours and two by sixes. Yeah, I mean, we'll use it, yeah, rough dimensional beamage. We definitely use a lot of hemlock. Yeah, we love it. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's got its um, tricky uh, characteristics, let's say. It's <laughs> yeah, a little bit yeah. tricky. You want to stretch before you pick it up. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to dry. It's a little bit heavy. It's a little bit hard to drive the nail into. But um, anyway, that's a good example. And red maple is another one. It's kind of the poster child for an underutilized species that we've got so much of um, in the state. So can we find other uses for these species going forward? Um, and the one that comes to mind to me for hemlock, for example, I don't know if you guys know of the company Go Labs that's building a wood fiber insulation plant at the mill in Madison. Yeah, I've read about that, yeah. Yep, so the old paper mill in Madison, Maine, yep. this company, Belfast Go Labs, bought it, and they're planning on um, producing wood fiber insulation. Um, so four by eight sheets that'll replace blue board or styrofoam. Yep. And think about that, you know, that's a petroleum-based product. And what wow. if we could build buildings with wood or with cross-laminated timber or glue lamb and then insulate the whole thing with wood from Maine as well? And that lends itself to lower quality, lower value species because you're grinding it up into mm -hmm. tiny, um, you know, fibers, kind of like the fibers that you use to make paper or MDF, medium density fiber board, right? <coughs> and you make an insulation product. So Hemlock's got a big potential for products like that. I, th I think one thing our listeners don't, they don't picture a lot is that th this you're using composite. So when you say composite, you're putting a little bit of glue or heat, some other materials in there and make forming new materials and sheets and whatnot and really using species that don't get used a lot yeah. and maine is the the most forested the, state in the country by percentage of land that's covered in forest we're number one yeah we have number one in the country yeah. yeah and right now as you know with everything that happened this year with the supply chain i mean it's lumber was scarce there for a while and the price has gone up and you know it's it's a different world. Like we're using different species that we, um, you know, we went, you know, using hemlock a lot more. Um, pressure treating shot through the roof. You know, it was hard to find that. So and all this new technology is Absolutely. really, really coming out at a good time. Yeah. Now, what about, um, you mentioned the 3D printer. What about 3D printing with um, wood? Is that a, with wood fibers or is wood cellulose? Is that a thing? Absolutely. So oh, that's, that's cool. actually our entire uh, effort in terms of 3D printing. We're, we're partnering with Oak Ridge National Labs. So that's part of the Department of Energy. Um, they're down in Tennessee and they work on all sorts of uh, nuclear power and you name mm -hmm. it. And what they're looking for is partner universities and they call it a hub and spoke model. Well, they'll be the hub and they want to look for spokes like us that have expertise in certain areas. And for Maine and for the University of Maine, it's really about forest products, right? That's where, where yeah. we can add value to them. They've got other labs that are doing metals, 3D printing with metals or with concrete or, or uh, things like that. But in our case, what we want to do is um, make uh, polymers or plastics that are filled with nanocellulose or, or so wood fiber that's yeah. ground down to a very small yeah. level, right? Call it microcellulose or nanocellulose, right? And that's what we're trying to incorporate. And it's like, do you guys use the wood plastic decking or the Trex decking? Oh, yeah. 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 It's the same idea, right? It's about half plastic and about half wood fiber. But what if we could print with that? And what if half of that plastic ended up being wood fiber? Or even better, what if we use bio-based plastics from trees wow. in Maine? So next door, there's a whole effort looking at how to make the plastics out of wood. And then we would fill it with wood and you'd make a 100% wood product that's printing homes, for wow, example. that's awesome. 
Now, you yeah. guys just did the world's largest boat, right, by 3D printers? Was it something like that? Yeah. <laughs> it's a funny thing, actually. It's um, it's a 26-foot-long boat that is printed in, in 70 hours, so just under three days. And we, it was printed the first thing we had printed. And then um, we took that boat after printing it, and we had a grand opening in the Guinness Book of World Records yeah. folks here. And we put Senator King and Senator Collins in the boat, <laughs> in our wave pool, our wave base <laughs> we have here. And um, it worked. That's awesome. <laughs> that's a huge feat. Congratulations. Yeah, that's very cool. I was also reading about a company um, up in Aroostook County that was doing these um, buildings now out of like some – I think it's wood composite structures, and they're sending them, uh, they're shipping them out to like schools and stuff as like a, another classroom and stuff to spread people out because of COVID. But a different also like type of materials. I'm not sure if that's related to you guys, but it's cool to see all the technology coming out of Maine in these times. Yeah, it could be cross laminated timber CLT that yeah. you're thinking about. I'm not sure, but we're doing a lot of research on that, um, and all that is is taking two by sixes and two by eights and laminating them into huge panels that might be 10 feet wide by 60 feet long and all you're doing is laying up the two by sixes side by side finger joint them together into long pieces lay them up side by side and then orient stack layers that are at 90 degrees to one another and you might have five plies or seven plies for example and we're perfectly suited in maine to produce that type of material because the feedstock are two by sixes well it turns out we can make two by sixes in Maine, right? And we already have five mills that already make um, very good lumber, um, spruce pine fir south. It's all Nelma um, mills. Um, so a CLT producer can start producing tomorrow using the spruce and fir that we have right here in Maine. And we've spent the last three years um, really trying to answer the questions that investors and CLT companies have um, to answer the question, why Maine? Because they're thinking about doing it in other places too. But yeah. we happen to think this would be a perfect place to site one of those facilities and then support that effort. Yeah. Nice. Now, you said that you've got a lot of you know, student involvement. Are you finding that the, techno the technology side of it is bringing more students in? You know, do you see an increase in interest from students? And do you think it's because of the technolo technological side of it? Because, I mean, the, the lumber industry has been around since day one in Maine, and it's just, you know, it's what we all know, but with the, adding this technology into it, it's almost updating it for modern day, you know, interest in younger people, which is always a difficult thing to do. Yeah, Forrest is not just you and your chainsaw anymore. Throw a computer <laughs> in there and some other stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and the answer to your question, Chase, is absolutely yes. And not only that, we have to shift gears, right? Yes. The, the, the mills, the Great Northern Papers are not coming back to Maine. If we're going to think that this, we should just wait this out and we'll have mills with 2,000, 5,000 employees again, it's just not going to happen, right? So we need to shift gears, think about how to make new, innovative products using technology and our brains and our engineering power and um that's what we're all about here. What's the next generation thing? However, we do have the workforce. We do have the history. We do have the trees. We do have the mill sites um, and the transportation network. So we're, we're perfectly suited to do that, but it's going to take a concerted effort, really, and getting these young people interested and involved. What, what's happened here um, is with the technology, like you say, the kids are much more interested about 3D printing on these giant printers using wood cellular wood products or, or the cross laminated timber. You know, we're not talking about, um, uh, you know, our grandparents' um, forestry type of thing. So it's a, it's a really good point. Yeah, we got, got to do all we can to keep these young kids interested in driving them in, as I stare at my daughter, <laughs> drive them into the forestry, indus, forestry industry. No. <laughs> now, now most, what do most students leave with for a degree out of your program? I mean, is it specifically building materials, wood composite technology? I mean, is there... A... I wish. <laughs> I wish, yeah. Uh, so... I'm not a professor here. I'm staff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing work, but the the 
uh, this is an interdisciplinary research unit, they call it, and that's just a fancy word, meaning we're not teaching classes here. It's a hands-on laboratory where we're uh, uh, inventing new products, we're manufacturing prototypes, we're doing all the testing, we're going through the code approval process, we're even involved with commercialization, and that can't just take people from the wood science department or forestry or engineering. It takes all of us working together and that will accelerate um, you know, the, all of these technologies being commercialized. So we don't do a lot of fundamental research, they call it, right? Um, we're doing applied research. Mm -hmm. We wanna do research on products that have a chance in a short time period, say 10 years, to get out there and become a real product. And if that's not the case, we're probably not working on it here. It. But to your question, it's wood science, it's forestry, a lot of engineers, so civil engineers, mechanical engineers, even electrical engineers, um, business people are working here in the building. Um, I think we have 51 different majors, the students from all over campus. Um, and some of it's just because it's a fun place to work. Another uh, <laughs> reason is they're getting good experience with real companies that will help them go out there and get a job when they're, when they're done with their time here. And you're, you're, your focus is on the 10 year kind of time frame for products from start to, you know, completion. And are there any like long term, are there any like long, long term projects like way into the future that you guys are focusing yeah, on or, or, is, uh, or is it more just the 10 year? Well, they can never be fast enough, right? We'd right. like to well, do it. Absolutely. We'd love to do it for next year, but um, you know, you think about some of these things realistically, and one example would be our offshore wind program. So we're actually developing uh, floating wind turbines, wow. and these are gigantic machines. So the ones we're talking about um, building are, are, let's call it 10 megawatt machines. The ones that you see out in the woods are probably one and a half megawatts. So wow. Wow. we're looking at, at 10 or 12 megawatt machines, 350 feet tall, you know, they're giant machines. But let's say you've got a 10 megawatt machine and you put a hundred of those out in the ocean, there's a gigawatt of electricity. That's the size of a nuclear power plant. The entire state of Maine, I, I believe only uses 2.4 gigawatts. So you have a couple of these farms floating out in the ocean 20 miles offshore. It's enough to power almost the entire state of Maine. Um, that's amazing. So there's an example of something that's not going to happen overnight, gotcha. right? We've been working on it for about 10 years. Yep. Uh, we put a, a prototype out off the coast of Castine. Um, there's no wood in these things, by the way. Well, actually, that's not true. The blades have balsa wood. <laughs> but it wood deposit. But um, this is another green engineering, green energy uh, project that we're heavily focused on here. Um, but that's going to take decades to come to fruition, right? In terms of full-fledged mm -hmm. farms, building an entirely new industry in the state, and not only building it for Maine, but hopefully exporting these things all over the world. Because right now we import all these wind blades you see, they're not made in Maine, right? They're made in Brazil or Korea or China, or, and they're imported. Why couldn't we make those things here? You know, we have Bath Ironworks that knows how to build big things. A, yep. a, a 200 foot long wind blades, nothing to them. Sure. And then the bases are concrete. Well, we have dragon cement right here in Thomaston. So why can't we start producing those things here and exporting them around the world? So that's a long-term vision that's going to take uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, right? But we've got to start somewhere. We've got to educate these students that are going to become the next leaders of these companies. And um, we've got a whole offshore wind test facility here so we can test the blades that are um, up to 230 feet long. So wow. the gigantic test. That's big. Yeah. <laughs> now, do you guys do um, a lot of work for the government and the military? Did you guys do the bridge in the backpack? I think I remember reading about back, back in the day. Yep. So that's another one. Um, that's a good example of so. So the way we work here, a lot of our work is funded by the federal government. Yeah. So you go out and you competitively compete for these grants with the Army or the Navy or the Department of Energy or Homeland Security or Agriculture or whatever it might be. Probably 75% of our funding comes from those types of grants. And the offshore wind program, for example, is heavily um, supported by the Department of Energy. And the cross laminated timber stuff we're doing is heavily supported by the Department of USDA, right? 
Um, but we also do um, probably 25% of our, our work is with private companies. So they'll come to us. Um, a lot of them are from here in the state and they want to uh, improve their products or improve their process. And we've got capabilities to do that here um, as well. I forgot your question. I've lost my train of thought. So remind oh, me. Oh, the bridge in the backpack. I remember reading oh, about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the example for that one, that's another way we work here, which um, that product was actually invented here yeah. and developed here. And then we spun off a company called Advanced Infrastructure Technologies that's in Brewer right across the river here. And they are now producing those bridges. Um, we used to call it bridge in a backpack. Now they're calling them uh, the composite arch bridge technology or something like that. I guess bridge in a, a little more fancy. <laughs> Sounded a little, uh, yeah. Um, I've got an image in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea with the bridge in the backpack and the reason the name came out is you've got these composite fiber socks, right? It's just a, it's a sock made out of fiberglass or carbon fiber or something. And you can roll it up and it does fit inside of a backpack. It's that easy. And the idea was you could, theoretically go out and make these things in the field. Um, now, granted, it's usually better to do it inside of a facility, better quality control, temperature, humidity. It's not snowing or raining or, or 10 below zero or what have you. So <laughs> most of them end up getting made um, right here in Brewer. But that is another technology that came out of this laboratory. Yep. That's cool. Yeah, it's all very fascinating. Makes me want to go back to school. <laughs> yeah, not me. <laughs> not me. <laughs> I'll go vicariously through Maggie. You've had enough math. Mm. <laughs> now, I mean, you, you know, part of any education, you know, try, try, try. Not everything is going to succeed. I mean, what are not not what are some failures? But how do you kind of tackle failures? I mean, you build off from them, like. Do you, how far into it? I mean, we kind of, with on our side of things, we get into these cabins. We're doing them whether we want to or not. You know, we we agree to it. No matter how much rot we find, is there a point where you guys get to where you say, okay, I'm done. This is this is not going to be viable. It's not possible. Like, how does that process work on your end yeah. of things? Yeah, that's a good question, um, and it's an important question, and it's a question that should be asked on day one, and unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes gets asked on year twelve. Right, right, right. You realize, you know what? If we had just done this math at the beginning, we would have realized this had no chance to make any money. So why did we bother? Um, so that that's what I was talking about with the applied research. We do make ask those questions at the beginning. If it's not going to be economically viable, why bother, why bother doing it? Um, there's a lot of research that could be done here at the university that we can make anything. We can get any design values. We could, But how much is it going to cost? And can you produce it in the state? And how viable is it long term? So typically, the way that ideally it works is you go through these stage gates, they call them, and you know you say, we're only going to invest X amount of money, and here's what we're looking for. And if that works, we'll go on to the second gate. But if it doesn't, let's kill it and move on to the next thing. Because research and development, people talk about it as a shotgun approach. You know, one out of 100 of them yeah. probably are going to hit. But if you don't shoot the other 99, you won't know that you've got that one winner and and frankly the bridge in the backpack for example that was a huge success that came out of this lab but i promise you we've got many others that we gave the old college try and, <laughs> and it didn't work out and you don't that's i mean you'll kind of sit, move on to something else but you'll kind of keep it as a frame of reference say okay you know we'll try this new thing and then possibly pull from some of your you know it's not like failures just go right away they kind of get shelled and say okay let you know we either go back to it or we can pull from that to make something better. You know, it's all it's always an ongoing process, I'm sure. We hope we learn from our mistakes exactly. and we learn <laughs> along the way. Um, if we don't, we're 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 in trouble. So, um, but it, it, it's a good point that uh, every project we do here, we hope we learn something. I think there's very few of them where we, where we get into it and say that was a complete waste of time and it never comes up again. I guess there's a few of them that, that happen from time to time. But Learning what not to do is a good lesson. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Just sure. Yeah, you guys must get into projects halfway oh. through and be like, oh my God, what are we doing here? But um, like you said, you have no choice. And, and <laughs> put enough energy into it and 
got the right attitude and you got the right resources and of yeah. course you can make it work but um you know yeah and it's that main way you know you, we a lot of times we, just, we go at it with gusto and we don't know what we're doing but you just you work through it <laughs> you know and you got to in it yeah whereas we're yeah we're we're in cabins working you know under camps you're in a laboratory you know very uh controlled <laughs> situation you it's uh but it's it's all the same principles you know you make it work the best you can find ways and if it doesn't you know, set aside, come back to it if needed, or incorporate it some other way. It, like Brian said, it, it's definitely the main way, and yeah. yeah, get done what you can. But this is all super fascinating stuff. Um, really do you have just... some, Maggie has a few questions. Yep. Yeah, we put some uh, information on our social media saying we're going to have you on the podcast, so some people put some questions up, so hopefully it won't be too hard for you. Let's hear it. All right, first question. Which two people have had the most influence on your career? Wow. Which two people have had the most influence on my career? Obviously not your parents after those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Well, actually, I did not decide to go to school um, to study wood until I was 31 years old, I think, wow. something like that. I had a previous life doing something totally different. Um, so I, I would say the two people here at the university, at least one of them is the director of the composite center, Habib Dagger. And the reason I say that he's a structural engineer, I took wood design here with him, but if you've ever been to the composite center and if you haven't, here's your invitation once yeah. this Corona thing has passed us, but, um, it's inspiring what's been built here. We've got a hundred thousand square foot laboratory, all made out of, well, a lot of it made out of mass timber and, uh, wood products. It's all glue lamb and pear lamb and things like that. And we're actually, we've just designed a 90,000 square foot addition to the building made out of cross laminated timber, um, to demonstrate that usage here in our building as well. But the scale of what's happening here is unlike any other university that I know of. Um, and the ambition to go big and to uh, really uh, have a vision for the future of the state of Maine, whether it be energy or whether it be forest products or whether it be 3D printing, you know, thinking ahead 10 years, what's next? And how do we get these students from Maine excited and educated and ready to go to take the reins from us old timers when we're ready to you know, sit back and do nothing but drink those? Um, so he's one of them. Um, my other boss here is um, Steve Shaler. He is the uh, director of the School of Forest Resources. Um, so he was also my advisor here um, when I was a, back when I was a student. And the same thing, right? There's, there's um, vision to uh, go above and beyond um, what's typically done at a, at a public university. And um, they think big and um, they're doing it for the benefit of the state and of the students of the state. And we realize, you know, we've got a problem with brain drain too with all our students wanting to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's get them fired up and excited. And some of these new industries that we're talking about um, are pretty exciting. And um, whether it's our wind wave basin or the uh, 3D printer or, or the, the cross laminated timber stuff we're working on, we're hoping to get these um, main kids, right? Excited yeah. about what we're doing, staying here and, um, and uh, doing the best we can. Yeah, or kids coming to Maine and, yeah. and wanting to stay here. <laughs> Keep that them. happens too. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're welcome as well. Any more questions? I do. Um, okay. Can you tell by looking at the wood sample the exact area of the state it comes from or if it comes from out of state? I wish. I keep saying <laughs> I wish. Your questions are, yeah. Uh, I just have to smell it and touch it. Yeah. <laughs> if you had one superpower, what would it be? To tell where each piece of wood comes from in the state. Now, yeah. can you quickly, I, you've been talking about glue lamb, pear lamb, strand board. Can you quickly just kind of differentiate between a few of those? Just Sure. Um, so, I mean, we start with a tree, right? And yeah. you can cut it up many different ways. And it depends on how big that tree is to start with and what you're looking to make. Um, so what can you do with that tree? You could cut giant timbers out of them, right? You can make big... 12 by 12 timbers or railroad ties or what have you, that's fine. 
But what if the tree is only six inches in diameter, for example, and you want to make a, a structural glue laminated timber? And all a glue laminated timber is, right, is you take lumber, two by sixes, for example, and you just laminate one on top of the other until you get a composite um, beam. And a composite is nothing more than two different materials put together into the same product. And for a glue lam, those two materials are wood and glue, right? So yeah. it's, it's, composite's a fancy word, but it, it could be as simple as just wood and glue. And in my world, that's usually what the two components are. Um, so if you laminate them um, in the same direction, all of them going in the same direction and make a beam, right? That's a glue lamb, a glue laminated mm -hmm. timber. Yep. If you cross laminate them and turn it into a panel with the same lumber you're starting with, now you're talking about cross laminated timber, mm -hmm. right? If you put them on their edge and you nail them all together and make a big panel, now you're talking about nail laminated timber. If you take that tree and strand it into wafers, and then dry them, apply resin, stick it in a press. You can make plywood, you can make oriented strand board, you can make all of these composites. And you can take that tree and start, the starting uh, element can be something very small. So we were talking about nanocellulose. If you take that tree and put it through a grinder and then through a refiner, and you get down to paper size elements or even smaller in case of nanocellulose, you get these really small pieces. First of all, it doesn't matter what species it is anymore. When you get down to cellulose, right, it doesn't matter whether it was hardwood or softwood or maple or birch or pine or whatever when you started. I shouldn't say it doesn't matter, but for the most part, it doesn't sure. matter. Um, and then you can use these things for a whole variety of, of different products. So basically, you're taking the trees, you're breaking them down, and then you're gluing them back together in some fashion to make some kind of composite, whether it be a panel or a beam or a, or um, or what happened. Perfect. Thank you. That cleared it up for me. <laughs> and yeah, the biggest thing out of that take out of that is nothing goes to waste, which is awesome. Yeah, just break it down to its basic elements, rebuild it how you need it, and come up with new cool ways to use it. I mean, that's. Sounds like fun. <laughs> that was another thing. Way back when you'd take a tree and you'd saw it into lumber, what percentage of that tree turned into lumber? You know, it could be pretty low. It could be percent, yeah. 50%. What'd you do with the rest of the tree? So the goal really is to use as much of it as possible, obviously. Yeah. And things like OSB, oriented strand board, right? When you take that log and you debark it, you're using almost all of that log, right? You're straining yeah. them in the wafers. Um, so your recovery is probably more like 90%. Wow. And obviously that's ideal. Yep. Yeah. Any more questions? Not today. No, nope, that's it. It's cool. a lot of information for everyone. That is a lot of information. <laughs> and I don't think we had to ask you to explain yourself too much. I think we kept up as best we could. Yeah, Russell, keep up the good work. I've, I know we're all proud of what you guys do up there. It really is the worldwide leading technology and we're going to take up on that invitation to get up there when this is over, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for uh, working with Noma, keeping us. It all it all keeps everybody going. So, yeah, thank you for all that you do, and thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Before we get off, I can't go the entire uh, podcast without talking about Eastern White Pine because Jeff yes. Easterling will kill me. <laughs> yes, we love Eastern White Pine as our favorite wood species by far. Very dear to our heart. <laughs> yeah. So we were talking about spruce and fir and structural lumber, right? Eastern White Pine um, is another very uh, valuable species in the state. And we do do research here on Eastern White Pine as well. And we're looking at it potentially to be used in cross laminated timber, for example, and aesthetically, right? It looks beautiful. So could you make cross laminated timber out of something that doesn't look quite as nice like balsam fir, but then on the outer layers, you put Eastern oh, white yeah. pine or some boards, Eastern white pine, and it's all a panel that you put up and it's stiff and strong, but it's also beautiful like Eastern white pine um, tends to be. So um, anyway, that's my little plug for Eastern yes. white pine. So I don't get <laughs> wonderful, uh, wonderful. Keep wonderful. Jeff happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Russell. See you, Russell. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That was cool. That was fascinating. I don't know if Maggie liked it as much as we did, but... Yes. <laughs> That's a yes. Yeah. I definitely want to make it up there to...
check out the lab and we'll take advantage of that. I mean, it's world worldwide leading cutting edge technology right here in Maine. So yeah, and again, it's using you know what we have and it really aligns with our brand though. Re recycle, reduce, use as much as you can, and don't give up. Be stubborn and keep plugging forward. Absolutely. All right, so now we've got the technical questions out of the way. Hopefully, Maggie can hit us with some nice, <laughs> easy stuff. Easy stuff from the fans. <laughs> and everybody tuning in, hopefully, you're not asleep. Um, that was great. Keep the questions coming for us, for the guests. We love them. It just makes it that much better for everybody. So, thank you. All right. Hello. Love the show. Wait, who's this from? Hi. Jeffrey. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Um, my wife and I recently purchased our dream cabin in WV. Because, West Virginia, I bet. Because we love the show so much. However, the cabin has run was renovated with pine board ceilings, and a few of the boards are wrapped and pulled through the nails. Oh. Any tips slash tricks on how to repair? Did you say wrapped or warped? Wrapped. It this might, is what it <laughs> might supposed to be. You say warped. This is when you just say put the screws to a. <laughs> 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 right <laughs> yes um yeah so grk makes a great finish head screw that you know it again it depends on how it was nailed on you know if it's finished nails you know if you can shove them back in if you're able to get the tongue back into the groove you should be able to suck it back up if the boards are warped pretty bad and there's tricks too we've i mean we, well, sometimes we have replaced a board like behind us you know, you cut the center of it out. You can cut the back of the yes, the groove out and slide it in. I mean, it's not easy. Sometimes you take two of them out and fit force it in. Yeah, yeah. Or so, yeah. Sometimes you have to use two board. You know, rip one down the middle. Rip one of the pine boards down the middle. Use two of them in there. There's ways to make it work. It all depends on how easily accessible, how it was fastened. But like Ryan said. First, screw, first try, just <laughs> sinking a screw and pulling it back together. Yeah, look out for electrical and stuff and pray. <laughs> Follow the nail line. Use the right size screw. <laughs> and on the wrong one? Oh. Okay. Ready? For yes. the next question. Yes. This one is from Carl Savage. Um, my question stems from the bullpen episode. In the initial run through of the camp, there were... I U magnets and or push pins in the frame or two. What is the family connection to Indiana University? As an Indiana U native, oh. I'm curious. Oh, I U. I thought it was, I was like, what is I U? Like, <laughs> interesting. My uncle Charlie went to Indiana University for oh. his doctorate in. Are they the Hoosiers? I don't know. I don't either. I think they are. Um, they, he went to Indiana University for African linguistics. That was his degree? He got his, he got his doctorate in African linguistics at Indiana University. What Do, would you go? So what was his first job after degree, his degree at African he linguistics? He joined the Peace Corps. Okay, that makes sense. And now he works for the State Department. He was based out of Africa. For, He's a diplomat, right? Yeah, many, many years. So put it, you put it And to so you, you've you been over to Africa. That's a pretty cool story real quick. You went over there, right? Yep, Ryan, you and your uh, cousins. My, my cousin Ryan and Ravi and I went to Niger to visit him one time. And Niger wasn't necessarily the most safest place, right? Niger's not the safest. It's not the you know wealthiest. The third was it third world. Definitely, it's dry. But you know, we were young. And they were carrying a snowboard. That's all I can remember, right? You <laughs> carried a snowboard. Someone... Ryan and Ravi, Ravi carried a snowboard. Their snowboards halfway across the world to snowboard in the dunes and it was summertime right yep it was such a pain in the butt but we did they got to say they snowboarded in the dunes yeah, absolutely and, it, and you're talking on your on your podcast 25 years later so it <laughs> worked out that's right that's right, right. Yeah. african yeah. linguistics yep this question is from steven healy i have a joke from wild bill but i won't say it <laughs> good choice <laughs> uh you show a lot of year-round upgraded renovations but you never show what the heating is or how you the heat is set up i don't see furnaces or baseboard heaters a wood stove occasionally but that's it what's your heating of choice we can't get anybody anyone, anyone no i know everybody knows everything my heat of choice would be a wood stove first 
Mine's a remote heat pump. <laughs> we, we're yin and yang sometimes. But we definitely use a lot of pro- propane Renai yep. heaters. Um, fireplaces tend, you know, mo- I would say 75% of camps want us to remove fireplaces yep. just because they're so inefficient. They'll either drag the camp down or hold it up. And they take up a lot of room, too. Yep. A lot of valuable real estate. Yep. But a lot of these camps, we, you know, we, the budget isn't there, so we get them to a point, and most of them aren't full year-round places and it's not we it's not that we don't have a plan for heating it's just not necessarily included in our piece of the work or the budget and i think season one and two we kind of did that and like we realized liability wise and budget wise let's just put that leave that for the homeowner a lot of times we'll set the stove in there you you notice like a couple times there was just a stove in there with no pipe right right you know and it is a liability on us we're not we're not experts so that's one of the areas where we tend to Hire, you know, Somerset Stove does a great job. We call them up. Yep. And some of this stuff, we can hire him, and he can do it more efficiently than us paying two or three of our guys. Absolutely. Yes, ab- absolutely. absolutely. And, you know, a lot of that stuff is something like, well, the homeowner will pay for that separate. You know, it doesn't come out of our budget. Like, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But the liability thing is, like, the biggest thing. And, and typically, and we don't do furnaces. No. We don't do any type of boiler systems because it's just a camp. It's just a cabin. You know, we'll just do supplemental heat to take the edge off, you know, late into the fall or early in the spring. And, and propane is probably the number one, right? Propane inserts and yep. metal asbestos. Yeah, and... it's easy. It's clean. Dixie and Je- Dixie and Chase pretty are, are metal asbestos experts, but you might not want to admit it. <laughs> we don't. That Pass was, it on. That was our last question. It's now Somerset, so. We did get one more question that I opened today, and it's a question I commonly get. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I think we need to address it because, you know, we get it. And the question is, a lot of the, you viewers... Are we going to be honest? Yes. Okay. Here we go. Honest. They're watching the show, and they notice when we install fridges, maybe half the time the fridges are oh. not oriented so the doors open the right direction. I thought you were going with a different question, which I'll ask afterwards. Oh, uh, no. This was... And you want the God honest truth on that one? Yes. It's the the last thing to go in is the kitchen. It's usually down the last couple of the last day, last couple of hours. We're out of money. We're over budget. We no no one's gonna use it. The homeowner can do it, it no, themselves. No, it, it works. It like, works. If it, it, if it works, we're done with it. That's how everyone asks. You know, how do you guys save so much money? Like it's stuff like that. Like it works. We don't, we don't worry care. about the. Yes, we don't worry about the orientation of the door. If your beer is cold and you have to reach with your left hand or your right hand, well, what, what, at least you're getting a cold beer. <laughs> so there's the answer to that burning question. I know you're all so and, losing sleep over. And I'm What's t- your question? And I'm saying in my head it's a pain in the ass to do, so let someone else do it. Yeah, if it's that big of a deal, yes. Yeah. So my question was, I thought it was about how much do we do our laundry. Wasn't there a little thing over there? Oh. Oh, yeah, I couldn't read that okay, one. I so can't read people's I, handwriting. That's what I was wondering. We have to be honest about this. <laughs> so... Our friend Karen Jones writes in to us. Um, she has a burning question from MCM. Construction is a dirty job, and it, who does all the laundry, and how many changes do the guys go through? I can look for the answer on the Facebook site. Karen, you're going to get it right here. You're going to get it right here. So, My mom. My mom does all the laundry. Not for everybody. For you. See, <laughs> Ash, I, I don't mind doing laundry. And you. Mom does all yours? Sometimes. Oh. I bring it down. She'll move it. She'll move it. Um, my stepmother did, like, Nash and I were living down in the basement at Higgins Street. Moved down. She did a lot of our laundry. <laughs> God love her. Thank you, Warren. But, you know, I I tend to do my laundry now because I used to do Ashley's, and I would shrink it. Like, so now I don't even Yeah. I stick with my stuff. I'll admit, in the summertime. But I don't change my clothes. I think that's what they're really In the summertime, you go through two or three T-shirts, and I have definitely thrown away a T-shirt or two after a day and being like, nope. This isn't even worth washing again. They but, just get so stinky, so gross. But like, like our pants, I probably I wear a pair of pants for a week or two. They get my... I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not answering this one. Oh come on! I change my underwear almost every day, but not in the sun, not in the winter. I really, sometimes I do. I just get busy. With, Fine, yes. I, I throw what's on the floor back on. I try to change my socks every day, underwear every couple of days, and pants and. Maybe once a month. Look at the sleeves on this. I wear. <laughs> I wear. <laughs> I wear the truth you got. I wear this until it starts smelling. You know, because it's just easy. It's on the floor. We're going to work. We're not impressing anybody. And then he wakes up and he goes, Sarah, where are my pants? <laughs> Honey, where are my pants? I change my clothes every day. 
Good. I saw, yeah, as everybody should. Some people on our crew change every day. Yep. That should be a who, who, good question. Who changes every day? Jeez. Yeah. Well, not us. Not us. Not us. And but, that's you know, it. We're that's also, it for fan questions forever. <laughs> we're also old and married, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. Good times. Yes. All right. So that's it for the questions. Do we have any new merchandise? Boy, do we ever. We have got a new custom T-shirt that's super soft. Oh, wow, that's wicked soft. Wait, okay, who's going to do this laundry now that I touched it? And it <laughs> says, welcome to the Buccane. Please enjoy your buck and stay. Oh, my God. Don't the kids love saying that? And it's got a little picture of the A-frame with little Christmas light. This is our holiday one. We're going to try and have a new seasonal one every season. Oh, I love it. Different color, but this is what we've got right now. It's definitely limited supply, so. Does me and Peggy have one of these? And the buck and A has been, I mean, I, everyone probably up. knows. But that's like one of the first camps for us episode. Yeah. Peggy bought it, and it stayed in the family, and it's a very important camp to us. And Yeah. Now it's on a T-shirt. But you can find this T-shirt. And I'm not doing that laundry either. CanavetCabinCompany.com. <laughs> and like I said, it's limited one, but we'll do them seasonal. So check it out. Yeah. My brain hurts. There's a lot of information today. That was. Let's keep the let's keep the information coming. Yeah. One last trivia thing. question. Trivia question. All right. So first we need to answer last, last week's last question. question. Okay. And again, so we now have a way to podcast at Main every week. Cabin Masters is the new. Email. Email your answer to podcast at maincabinmasters.com. Nope, nope, no, nope, wrong. nope, 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 nope. If, if when we watch the episode, if you, we pick you the winner, like, so Christine S. was the winner last week, and I don't know if I got her information quick enough. So Christine S. from the YouTube channel, podcast at maincabinmasters.com, and we're doing the discussion. If you get it, if we declare you the winner, that's where you'll send your information. Or if you have questions, right? Okay. Trying to streamline it. Is that right, everybody? Sure. sure. As you can see, technology is not a number one thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> Neither is she bathing, apparently. No. <laughs> uh, so, Kay. last week's question. Last week's question was, if you cross an eel rut, what are you crossing? Any ideas, folks? Oh, I haven't even given this one a thought. How is it spelled? Eel, like... E-E-L. Slither eel. And rut like R U T. Uh, that that stream out beside Puddle Dock Road is an eel rut. Eh. Wrong. I was thinking it was a wagon wheel rut. Eh. Wrong. Water is close. Like it has something to do with water. An eel rut. Drainage ditch. Nope. Mud puddle after the meals got you after. You guys are so far off. What? what? Is it? A very small harbor that drains out at low tide. Oh, gosh. An eel rut? I call it a wading pool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We now know what an eel rut is. An eel rut. What is that question from? Like 1642? Bunga oh, nut's an eel rut. Yeah, bunga nut is an eel rut. Geez, Dr. Sir, that's a nice eel rut you got there. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you picked him. <laughs> this week's trivia question okay. is... This week's trivia question is... Lobsters are measured between what two points? A and B. <laughs> Not the answer. I'm what for. What is A and B? All right. Yeah. If you think you know the answer, watch the podcast on Monday night. Watch the podcast Monday night. When it comes up, be the first person in the comments to give me the correct answer. And then email your info to podcast at maincabmasters.com. We've got it figured out. We're good. Thank you all for tuning in. We want to thank our sponsors, especially Nelma, for everything they do for us and for the main composite center. You can find more about Nelma at nelma.org, easternwhitepine.org, sprucepinefur.org, Hero Media Arts, and Hammond Lumber Company, the official building materials supplier of Kennebec Cabin Company. Thank you to Russell Edgar, and for everybody who tuned in, listen, keep the questions coming, keep the comments coming, keep and. Thank you for turning in. From the woodshed, we'll be talking to you.